set this up in the uh, in the reserves, and you're really setting people up with some basic toolboxes. You get them so that they're basically like that, and then as soon as they break the tool, what do you do? You go out and buy the best you can find to replace it. Why? Because you know you use that one, and you know you're going to need it again if you're breaking it or wearing it out. It's like hex sets. If you get wrench sets or hex sets, the cheap ones will eventually break, but there's only one or two sizes that break because those are the only ones you use. And you need all the other sizes for that one bloody nut that doesn't, you don't have anything to deal with. So by getting a generalized, inexpensive set, and then I'll go in and put a really nice snap-on or something to replace the uh, sockets that I'm actually using. And then the whole thing works pretty well. You, of course, need pliers, and the very first pliers that you need are like vice grips, because the vice grips are the pliers that are very cumbersome, but they'll grab anything. Unfortunately, you use it for everything, and you tend to strip or, or tear things apart because you have a lot of power. It is good, though, to have a, there's a lot of vice grips in the market, by the way. And so, okay, pair of vice grips, because you'll always be frustrated. If you only have the big one, you need the small one. If you only have the small one, you need the big one. Now, when you're talking about pliers, this is another one that I really like to have around the house, is that this thing will quickly adjust to all kinds of sizes. And you can get into plumbing, you can get into a lot of stuff with it. So this really open jaw plier that goes way up or way down that easily is extremely useful. Big handle, you've got a lot of leverage and that kind of fit. Then, of course, there are other pliers like needle nose, wire cutters, and all that. It depends. If you're not doing electricity, you probably don't need wire nose. Um, some of these other mechanical ones are a little more specific. We tend to use them more in electricity, put wires together and stuff like that. You can get by with them, even a ice cream if you had to. So you get into specialty stuff as you find that you need it. Um, while we're into the wrenches things, the old crescent wrench, again, you need a little one in the big one. Okay? And that's, it's a good idea to have just, you know, there's so many gadget ones on the market and some of them really work. Have at least a basic one around. And then you can get that fancy one that's automatic ratchet and everything else. But uh, they tend to break and wear out much faster than these do. And if you've got a basic one, you can always make it work as you get in. Now, of course, what happens is when this is not working anymore because you're running off the nut, that's when you go to this and you're then grabbing the nut as hard as you can. Don't forget, when you squeeze the nut, particularly if it's not too big, really hard, you squeeze it onto the threads and make it harder to take off. So although you've got a better grip, you're actually tightening it up on the bolt and having trouble getting it off as you're going after it. So here's a new one out by uh, Black & Decker. Now, this one is... Uh, they have one that's actually a ratchet, or is this a ratchet version? So here's a ratchet thing. Now there's something really fascinating about this guy. It's kind of bulky, it won't fit everything. It's great on bicycles okay, and things like that. You can't get it in where you get a little socket set. But this is one of those things, and it was really amazing. I, I worked with these guys to figure out how it worked, because it's both metric and imperial. Well, that's actually, how do you get both metric and imperial? Well, it turns out, that almost all of the sizes are pretty close to each other between metric and imperial. Hey, we got real microphone. You don't have to. Hi, we're not we're not on a live stage here. Let's see if that works. I love your clip. That's good. This is another thing about making sure you make anything work. So he's got a paper clip to hold it on here. It's going to go turn up. <laughs> but the uh, what they've done is that with the socket, it's grabbing on the ears of the hex, right? That's what wears out and goes around. This thing, the ears are pulled back. The corners are pulled back. And it actually grabs to the center on the flat. And as it moves towards the ears, that flat part gets in there. And that actually lets it jump over the tolerance differences between metric and period. And so that's how it actually works, is if you put it on, you'll notice that it's not perfectly hexagonal. It's not flat. It goes out in the edges and gives it some room. It's because the center is what's doing the work instead of the ears, which means I never strip a bolt, which is a really good design in these kind of wrenches and how they cheat it to get both metric and curve. The other wrench that, if you don't know it, you've got to get them, are these strap wrenches. Okay? So the strap wrench is that basically the two sizes are useful. This strap comes up and goes around, usually plumbing of some sort. You bring it back and lock it in here. And then you cinch it up to where you need it by so like pulling it together here, and I get it fairly tight. And when I go back on this clamp part, if I can show that to the camera here, of course the camera was looking off somewhere else. There we go. <laughs> there 
So then you have the power to turn this thing. And what's nice is it fits anything you need and it's not making marks or anything else. So in plumbing and an awful lot of things, these strap wrenches are not gadgets. They are really fantastic. That's always fun when I see a professional taking notes out here. He's writing down it. He wants some strap wrenches. This particular one comes in a set of two, a small one and a big one. It's really cool because then you can go against each other. You know, and you've got one really good leverage, the other will actually hold it. Just like two big pipe wrenches. So if you're not a plumber, don't buy a pipe wrench. Get strap wrenches. Now, you can't do heavy duty iron. It's not going to get the grip. But for everything else we're doing, it does good. It also takes care of all these, these things. You get, now, these are too tight on the traps. The strap wrench works great because it doesn't mess them up and gives you really good power. To turn that grip over. Okay, we'll go back to plumbing in a minute. So that's those things. Hammers, I really recommend in the house that you actually get two hammers. A little diddly one like this. Now, most people say, I don't want a little diddly one. But when you use this and you drive a small nail and drywall and you miss, it's a big hole. <laughs> this one actually is quite useful tacking small things, getting in corners. The ears are all different. If you go, go through the hardware store and look at these things, actually, is the, part of the funniest story, because one fun thing with the television is that we had a team to do research. And when I started looking at some different hammers, I started seeing some trends. So I went to the hammer manufacturers and I said, teach me, why is the hammer the shape it is? Because when I started looking at these things, Japanese hammers, where I learned my trade, actually, they have a very small neck here, and they flare out like a cone, and then they have the head. It's really got a strange shape. The German hammers are square and bulky all the way back, kind of like Germans. Okay? And they come straight back. And the North American is a compromise between Asia and Europe. And it goes halfway between the two. So what we know as a hammer is not standard around the world. And there are lots of interesting different things. The curves on the back, this one curves down like this because it's really made as sort of a standard hammer and it rocks very well for pulling out nails. The ones that come straight back are framing hammers because you're using like a hatchet to dig into the wood and pry it apart. And that's why a framer has absolutely straight ears out here. If you saw that in yesterday's demonstration, we have framing hammers. And they came straight back out. And there are a lot of differences. Then you can get a stiletto for 300 bucks a hammer. Okay, but I'm not sure you want to get into that. But they're really great, great hammers. Um, they have magnetic starters on here. You put the nail up here. And that is good for reaching up really high and, and planting the nail and then coming back to it. Except it's very difficult to get used to do it right. But I do suggest two little hammers. Oh, by the way, if you're doing a lot of framing, this is not the home hardware kit. If you're doing a lot of framing, you get a waffle head on here. That's what we needed yesterday so that people who hit the nail not straight didn't slide off. That waffle head in framing is very good. Okay. You, ought, you need some clamps, and generally clamps should come in pairs, or close to being pairs, because you never use a clamp alone. It's always too open. These quick grip things are really useful, and one of the things you can do with it, and you've got to play with the screw, well actually you don't play the screw, this one's right here. So it pops out real easy, goes on the other end, locks in here, and now I can use it to push things apart instead of pull them together. Okay? So you can actually you can use two of these together, I should have put the small one in reverse, but you can put one on the outside and one on the inside on the same boards and actually have a really good hole on it as you're trying to go in both directions. So you position something perfectly. Okay, that's our gripping stuff and our right? hammers. Mm -hmm. Now you notice I have any power tools it's yet, but we're going to get a little bit of yeah. This, your spatulas come in two basic it's varieties. There's, yeah, here we go. You see this guy's flexible? He thought he was going to get away from this flexible one is really used basically for putty. We don't do a lot of putty anymore, but that's so that you can lie it down smooth. The rigid one is more of a scraper for going and scraping things up. So when you grab on the store, find out if it's flexible or rigid because you use it for different things. Then you need different widths. A pair of these things is the best thing you can have in there. They are very standard. You find them in all the stores. It is the best thing in the world. You can use it as a scraper a little bit, but you can jam it in, particularly on trim, and floorboards and things like that, and it's just the neatest, easiest way to slide this thin, strong metal, pull things apart, get the trim.
trick. You just uh, pull, you, you got a piece of wood trim, and I didn't bother to bring one, I didn't think about it, but you've got a nail in the wood trim. If you pound the nail back out, it splinters all the time, and you lost a little bit You don't pound it back out. They're all finish head nails. You take your vice grips on the pointed side of the nail, on the back side of the wood, you grab a hold of it, and you roll it back on the head, and you pull the nail right through the wood, and you get a big splinter on the back, and nobody cares. And sometimes the putty's still there on the other side of the paint. Sometimes there's not even a hole on the other side when you pull it out that way. And then you can use the same print, put it back, tack your nail in, and just finish it off. Okay? Um, let's see. Talking gun. The only one talking gun I like, which is this one, or something similar to it. What is that I like? I got two bars opposite each other. You get that open casing out here, and you put the tube in, and eventually the open casing falls off because you're putting a lot of pressure on it, bends off and falls off, and it's, it's broken. It's not worth the cost difference. You go to this thing, cost you maybe a buck more, but it will hold up forever if you're going. Okay? Now, they make little ones with little rods to punch your cocking. They're almost useless in Canada because they're made for the United States. I've tried to talk the Chinese manufacturer into making them an inch longer because our Canadian tubes tend to be longer necks on the end, and PL premium, you can't reach in the bottom okay, as you're trying to go in. So you, you, that, that gadget is a great idea. The manufacturers haven't figured out the tubes are. I talked to the guy in Hong Kong. He said, oh, yeah, didn't know that. <laughs> I said, give me one more inch. It's not going to cost you a lot. Said, oh. Now, we're in the toilets here. I got a leaky toilet. It just sort of runs all the time, not on the floor. You know, you can see it running in there. You can hear the noise or it's filling and then stopping all by itself at night. The very first thing to check is to find out if there's a problem in the connection between the toilet and the bowl. And you do that by putting food coloring in the top and don't flush it. You don't flush it at all. It's just normal. Just go ahead and put some food coloring up there. If food coloring shows up down here. Then what we know is that the water is sliding past this flapper. And if you take a look at the flapper, you'll see that, particularly if you use some of those uh, chlorine pucks to clean everything, you'll see the flappers become like an uh, oyster. It has this ripple shape all around. Or it's starting to get black, and you touch it, it all comes off of it. So it ends up leaking right through here, and you change the flapper. It's as simple as that. Okay? That's the major change for that flow. And flappers, there's all kinds of flappers on the market, including ones that are adjustable. That is to say, there's a dial on it. You turn the dial, and it changes how much water goes through before it closes. And so you can get it so that you use as little water as possible, but as enough as you need to really clean things up. Okay. Another thing on toilets while we're at it, if you've got to lift up the toilet, you'll discover that under the toilet, there's a wax ring, like this. This is the only wax ring I'll ever use, is the one that has the plastic horn in the bottom, built into the wax. The reason being is that why, how does this whole thing work? Let's take a look at a toilet here. Let me drop out of this, and we'll run into my old program that I used to use uh, when we were on television, at just as John Eakes where I used to do this live. I could spell better in those days, but, uh, so let me just see how this toilet's going to work here. Uh, which one do I want? Um, we're gonna be talking about that wax ring on the floor. Okay, I gotta see the floor here. Um, here we go. So if you see that, right down here, I wanna put my pointer here. So right where this joins the floor down here, you can see there's this wax ring, and they do have a horn in this one. You can buy just a ring of wax. There's no plastic in it, just a wax. And it seals the toilet to the floor. The problem is the water still flows past that area and hits the plywood sometimes if the whole drain is not perfectly right. If there's anything wrong in here, it has a chance of giving you some trouble inside. Now, this is supposed to be a lead liner. It comes up and wraps over the top of the plywood or the, you know, whatever it is. And so everything is all watertight, but sometimes it's not. The wax ring has this advantage. You see, the, the plastic liner means the water goes down about an inch and then falls in below. And you can have lots of stupid mistakes up above, and it's forgiven. It just it makes it it's going to work easier under all conditions. Now, you've got one of those toilets that will not sit flat. It rocks. It happens, particularly on a tile floor, and not everything's flat. Okay, the secret is that you are going to come along and you're going to wax, you take candle wax, you wax the bottom of the toilet where it sits on the floor. 
So the personal, you get a heavy coat of wax on it, so nothing will stick. And then you take PL Premium. PL Premium's construction adhesive has unique characteristics that it does not shrink when it cures, and it cures by moisture, so there's no solvents to come out of it. And when it's finished, it's rock hard like, like ceramic. And you put a nice thick bead, a BL Premium, right where it's going to sit. You might mark that with a pencil, first of all. Gently put the toilet down. Don't screw it down or anything. Just gently put it down so it's in place. Go away and leave it for a bit. And when you come back, you can pop the toilet off because of that wax. Now, if you forgot to wax, you're dead. <laughs> that toilet will never come up again. <laughs> but if you wax the bottom, you lift the toilet up, and here's this gasket, perfectly manufactured to fit the, both the toilet and the tile. And it gives you an absolute hard fit. There's no more rocking. Nothing's going to shake. And it's solid. Okay? BL Premium. That's the key to get that thing going. Okay. Let's go back out of here and go back into our slideshow if we can get that up. And see if we can. I have a thing that tells me I can go on from there. Probably not. It's going to start all over. Okay. That's the flapper. You can see the waffle shape it takes when it gets old and cruddy. And that's the new one on the side. And so that's the real difference in the quality of those two things. And here's my wax ring with a funnel that goes in and makes it all better on the bottom. Hi, Blake. I'm going to need you for this, Chris. Let's say whether it's metal, plastic, anything, any kind of pipe. In fact, for the moment, let's get rid of the dishes so it can work easier. Now, that's got a lot of dirt needs to be cleaned off there. But probably one of the best things for fixing, particularly quick fix, but you can, and it's better if it's totally dry, but you can actually fight this a little bit with a little bit of water in there, is a thing called Magic Wrap. Magic Wrap is actually a roll of neoprene rubber. It's not particularly cheap, and its use is surprising as to just how to do this, is that we've got to get it so that we can get a little piece of this off. And what we've got here is your plastic backing on the thing. It's not really sticky at all. It's just rubber. Okay, and it's neoprene rubber. Uh, yeah. So the mistake is people don't really quite figure out how to use this thing. They so say, we want to do this joint, so we're going to start like that. Then you're going to pull this thing out, and you'll learn when it's going to break. But you go almost to the breaking point, and the hard part is getting that first, because I got to wrap it back on itself before it's going to stay put. So we'll bring this up there. You've got a finger up, okay? And then you come around, and as soon as the first wrap, when you get your finger out, it works better without a finger. Okay. Now, now what you're going to do is you stretch. And if you look at this thing, you see how far I'm stretching? That's what you need to do. Because as you do this, and then you go around and around onto the next side, and then you come back and work the other side, what happens is it actually, the proper term is vulcanization. It actually will fuse to itself and become one piece of rubber. It vulcanizes. So because we can have it wet, but we can't have it dirty. So you kind of think, well, it's going to be wet. What's there? And when you put this on underwater, you actually work it in. You just keep going. Because when you first put it on, it kind of skitters along and doesn't stick. Then you'll realize what you're doing is pushing the water out. And as you push the water out, it sticks. It doesn't need to be dry. It just needs to push the water away so it sticks. And you'll feel it. And you'll see it when it starts to stick. And then you can keep smearing, keep working, and get it around. And this becomes a permanent bond. The amazing thing is this particular stuff will stick to just about anything, including lawn furniture, plumbing pipes, metal, wood, plastic, it's, and it stays flexible. It's an incredible, incredible glue. So that's a, a real necessary part of your, your home kit when you're doing it. So bucks and punch sticks. You're doing copper soldering. I don't know if any of you have problems with soldering copper and pipes and making sure that it actually doesn't leak. Or you get that little pinhole, you know, that frustrating thing. Yeah, I see some heads going, yes, that, that one little jet of water that comes out when you thought you did a really good job. It was really frustrating to me because I used to be good at soldering. And then I went to do it one day for the television, and we did a beautiful solder job. We turned the water on, <laughs> pissing out. So I tried to fix it, and I finally sent the camera guys to lunch, and I said, I'll figure this out by the time you get back. And then I did all kinds of manipulations, and we finally got it so it passed. And so then I said, OK, what's going on? I went to George Brown College, which is a trade school in Toronto. And I went to the plumbing trade school, and I said, why did I used to be able to solder copper, and I can't do it now? What happened? And the guy soldered, no trouble. And I looked at his 
He is rich. He's soldering with the settle. I said, oh, you're soldering a settle. He says, yeah. He says, we always do. I said, okay, but no, the homeowner can't buy a settle. The homeowner doesn't have a settle. He's got a propane torch. And the guy said, oh. So I gave the pro the propane torch and the homeowner stuff and his junk leads. Okay? So then we went into a research program to try to find out, okay, what did they do? What did they change on this? Well, they went from lead solder to lead free solder. And what happened when they did that is that we found out, and there's a chart on my website. If you go to my website and look up soldering copper pipes, you'll actually see this whole story and, and pictures about the chart. That basically what it boils down to is there's a certain amount of time, well, the flux, you know when you put flux on first? And the flux is there to keep the copper from oxidizing so the solder can stick properly to the copper and there's no space left. If the flux burns off, the copper doesn't stick properly. And that's where that pinhole comes from. So if I heat it so much to, to burn off the flux before my copper gets there, I'm in trouble. We used to have a lot of time with lead and solder. There was a big time span. It got soft really fast. And that was before the flux was melting off. So we could flow that solder in, and it worked. Now we've got a little tiny span because the new solder, you've got to get it really hot before it flows. And by the time I get it hot, the flux is gone. So that's a real pain. So you can't use propane to solder anymore. You gotta use MAP gas or polybrotoline, which is their new MAP gas replacement. And they do sell it in the stores, but it's a step up from propane. So leave propane for burning paint, for barbecues, and for things like that. And you go to polybrotoline now, or if you still see it sometimes, MAP gas, it's a hotter solder and gets it in. Now, there's a couple other things that can help in that if you're really getting in trouble still, and you're having trouble with this lead-free solder, is that they now sell, and I forgot to bring it from home, and it's hard to find. If you go on the website and look for a thing called Just for Copper, there's a glue that you put on, and it's actually stronger than solder. And it's made just for copper. That's why it's called Just for Copper. And it actually is a glue for plumbing. It's improved, meets all the same standards as the solder does, and it works. Now, it's more expensive. That's why the plumbing shop is Okay. No heat at all. You put it on the same way, you go in, yes. do about a quarter turn, it's done. Okay? And they have some that have a color so that you can see it, other ones don't have a color, but they work it out, it works. The plumbers tell me it's fantastic stuff, but I can solder cheaper than I can buy that, so I'm not going to do it. Except sometimes for larger units that I get into. Now there's another possibility that I did burn. If I can just, where did I put it? Here, the one here. This thing that's made by Oakley is a, a little bit of lead-free solder, a brush, and uh, the rosin, okay? The difference is this rosin is very special to solve this problem. The pros will use this for six-inch diameter pipe because they even have trouble getting around the pipe in time before it goes off. The rosin itself, that stuff that we don't want to let burn off, has silver in it. And so it deposits silver as it burns off, which means it primes the copper. So it's more expensive. But even the pros will use this on six inch diameter stuff because now they can just, they go on, they take their time to heat it up and they know inside that it's all coated with silver before their, their solder gets in there and it works every time. So this stuff, which they actually call safe flow silver lead free, it's silver lead free soldering, plumbing solder kit, but it's got silver built into it. Now it's more expensive, but you'll never have another problem soldering. So if you can't find the glue, then this could work. Or if you want to use the glue, but some inspector says, I don't trust it, go to this stuff. <laughs> and then you'll have it with the standard copy. Okay? So you didn't think we were going to get those kind of details. Huh? Okay, that's our silver flux solder. And uh, let's see, what else do we have up here? Vinyl floors. When you get vinyl flooring, and I didn't have a setup here with where we could glue this all down. Here we got some squares of vinyl floors. And this is brand new stuff, so it's not like the stuff that you've got on your house that's been there for 25 years and it's gotten brittle already. Our biggest problem is if you've got a broken one, you've got to deal with it. If you turn this too much, it breaks, right? And then you've got it snaps. So the question really is, how do you move this for a fair distance without it breaking is that you make sure that it's warm. And so without burning it, you actually bring in your hair dryer or your hot air gun, or you can even put a piece of cloth on the floor and take a hot an iron. Don't forget the cloth, your wife will shoot you if you get glue on your iron. Okay, so 
But if, when you warm this thing up, and by the way, the same thing applies to roof shingles. If you got to do a little patch job on a roof shingle, you don't want to get it hot enough to blister. You don't want that asphalt coming up, and you don't want this thing to blister either. But when you do warm this thing up considerably, particularly if you're working, well, I can go a long ways this time without snapping. Okay? Also, you'll notice the glue reactivates. It's like compact cement. And so with the glue reactivated, when I've got two pieces stuck together, and I, or this is just down on the plywood floor even, and I want to roll the other piece up, I'm going to give a spatula there. The spatula, I've got the spatula's over there in the toolbox. And just come over here and slide in on that corner and see how that lifts up. Yeah, just slide the corner there. And you can see how that's just got it. It doesn't want to come except where I formed it up. And that way, you can actually, if you have to, you can get it off without damaging it. And get down there. Or if it's already damaged, you get it off without damaging the floor. Because you're not ripping off the bottom of the floor to get that out of there. So a hot air gun and all these vinyl things can help. You've got a big sheet vinyl, it's got a tear in it, you've got to replace it. If at all possible, you've got another piece in the closet or someplace you could steal, you could actually go steal a piece with the hot air gun, pull it out nicely, come back, never do it in square patch. Try to follow the pattern. I don't have a pattern here, so it's difficult. But if you've got, if you have no pattern, do an irregular cut. If I do straight lines, what happens is it never matches. It shows like a square. If I do kind of odd things, you'll kind of notice there's something maybe on the floor, which you're not sure. So you can get that. And the way you do it is you actually put the piece lightly down there, and then you cut through both pieces at the same time. And it makes the same pattern. You just have to cut very, very straight. And by cutting, it's like the same thing we do when we do inlay work, is that we'll put a veneer down, and we'll actually cut both veneers at once. And then we just pull off the bottom veneer and fit in the top of it. And it comes through. So those are little tricks. Also, with sheet vinyl, you can sometimes take a razor blade and slice a bubble open get some glue underneath, put it back down, wax paper on the top, and then a weight. Wax paper so that the weight doesn't become part of the floor. <laughs> okay. But then that way the wax paper peels right back up, and that bubble that you have is now glued down. And all you did was one little slit. You didn't do that. You didn't bend anything up enough to deform it or rip anything. Just get a little bit of any kind of glue down there. Glue it down. Okay. Um, whoa, time's going on fast, isn't it? Let's see what else we can talk about. Water problems running from the house. When you slope this way, water's heading in. We talked about this yesterday in Fresh Street Wood. Slope out, and ideally the downspout goes as far away from the house as the hole when you dug to build the house. Normally five feet. The reason being, the soil all in here, well this is why in new houses, the soil all here is not compacted. It settles in a couple of years, and you end up with this depression. So you should be coming back and raising that up so that it all slopes away the other way. And you'd be amazed at how many problems we solved in the basements without any other expense than landscaping out here and getting those downspouts away from the bottom. Sump pumps, let's look at this real quick. The uh, sump pump is over here. So you put a sump pump in, and basically there's a valve here that floats up and turns it on, and then the pump, and this is a submersible pump that goes in the water. They're the best pumps. If you're replacing a pump that's up on a big stem, replace it with submersible, because then you can cover the well, everything else, it all works down there. And the motor stays cool all the time, because it's in the water. So it keeps the casing cool if it has to work a lot. But how do you actually build a sump pump so it works well? This is a CMHC drawing how to do a sump pump, but let's go take a look at the ideal sump pump, which comes out of Winnipeg. It's called a Sabre pump. Made it in, where it's kind of big, it's actually about three feet tall. And so it's a big hole down there. But the elements in here are the elements to learn about a good sump pump. The bottom is sealed and closed. You don't touch soil. I'm not sucking any dirt up. I'm not, not drawing soil away from the bottom of the house. The holes that let the, because they're concrete slabs all the way up. Whoops, that was not the right button. Let's see if we can go back. Oh, now we've got a ribbon. That's the previous. And go to. So the concrete slab is up here, down the top. So what happens is the soil lets all this water trickling through here. It free falls to the pump. And there's actually a space above it that separates the soil from the sucking action of the pump. And that space that's allowed here, and you usually don't build that in your own sump pumps, is what stops it from eroding the soil under the house. Because if you're sitting too close 
to where that water is, you'll actually suck the dirt in. By being down here where the, this is going to be a free fall in, and it cleans up, and there's usually air. And this is actually falling through the air once it gets started. It falls through the air. It's just there's no pressure to erode the soil, or very, very little. The pump is not adding to it. And then it goes up the top, and the whole thing can be closed at the top, so we have no vapor coming into the house and adding moisture into the basement of the crawl space. And so that's the ideal sort of sump pump. So if you're building for yourself, keep that in mind. Make sure you've got a concrete box in the bottom. That's actually a box. There's not, no dirt down in the bottom. And then the pipes or holes that come into it, free fall into it from up above as you come in. Now, when it's time to actually get rid of the stuff out of there, still working on sump pumps, and where they get hurt. This I've seen with basement systems. I'm trying to run down where else we can find it, and they gave me one yesterday, so the first time I see a product name, I might be able to find this on the web now. But uh, basement systems who were there yesterday, uh, the only people I've ever seen that have this. This is actually a sump pump discharge. So my sump pump is coming out of the house and then coming here. I'm on the outside of the house. When all things are going well, it's a free fall into a larger pipe down here that goes off to wherever it goes to. Now, when this pipe freezes up, not if this pipe freezes up, when this pipe freezes up, what happens is the water now, which is warm because it's coming from inside the house, will go out through these jets, and it'll be able to go out without blocking because it's under pressure and it's above freezing. So it'll cut its own way through the ice. And so it makes a mess out here. It looks like an octopus, but it's outside the house. Instead of the sump pump, it just doesn't work anymore because the pipe is all blocked up. So it gives you a chance to go deal with the blocked pipe, the hot water down, whatever you got to do, but it means that we get a flow off whenever we need that sump pump, even if it's freezing temperature outside. For cold weather housing, this is really critical. The only place I know for the moment to get it is at uh, basement systems. How much time we got until 10, 15? 10, 30. Okay, good, so we're not out yet. Okay, CO detectors, smoke detectors, and all those things. Here's the primary thing I want to do. I'm gonna pass this around, and I'd like to get this one back. For a year, one of the fun things about being on television is that people listen to you, okay? And, and sometimes some important people listen to you. Yeah, when I first started, I didn't know that. And, you know, I was kind of like everybody else. I wish I could talk to the manufacturer and everything. When I found out that I could really badmouth people on television and it would shake some trees, that was fun. So I do a lot of it on purpose. And so one of my badmouthing things that I just discovered today when I opened this package that somebody is listening to is that smoke detectors have a lifespan. And when you get a new box, it actually tells you on the box, but nobody reads it. And particularly smoke detectors like this one that are hardwired, so there's no battery, which means you never look at it. What do you do? You test it every once in a while, right? What you're doing is testing the sound system. You're not testing the detection system. And even some of these smoke detectors are designed to be used one single time, and they're disposable. Because once the smoke actually gets in there, it's dead. So you certainly don't want that one around the kitchen in the toaster. Okay, so some of them actually will only go off once and that's it. Because a gel in there gets colored and it doesn't work anymore. So you have to be careful what kind you have. But our biggest problem is that we may test them, but we don't really test the mechanism and it can sit there for a long time. If you look at it, most of them are guaranteed, like this one, five year warranty. My life is more important than the six year. Okay? Because these do save lives. That's the incredible thing we found out since we've really been putting them in. It's saving like something like 90% of all deaths. Not stopping fires, but stopping the deaths because the people get up and go. Okay? So that's really important to look at. And I kept telling people, when you first install one, get a felt pen out and do the yogurt thing. Best before. So you take your date, you see it's five year guarantee. So 2017, I want to change that out. What did I discover today? It says right here, replace in 2020. Now, when you put that up, you're going to laugh about that because, because 2020, that's a long ways away. But you're going to look at that in 2025, and then you're going to say, oh, my God, has it been that long since we did that renovation? And all of a sudden, all your smoke detectors are out of date. I would probably say 80% of them in Canada are over the life expectancy. Luckily, they tend to still work, but that's not a guarantee anymore. And so check those dates. Now, if you're doing maintenance on houses and you're going around, that's one of the things you check. And if it doesn't have a date, put one out there. So at least, if it's not the right date, there is an end date. And that'll be changed up at some point. 
Critically important. Second importance, research on response to smoke detectors. They, have, they did a whole bunch of studies in the United States where they simulated a fire with the help of the parents, but they waited until the kids went to bed. So the kids were sound asleep. And then they went in there with theater smoke. You know, enough theater smoke that it could just fill the place with smoke. And everybody was kind of hidden so the kids wouldn't see anybody. The theater smoke would set off the alarms and they wanted to see what the kids did. They found out half the small kids hid under the bed or in the closet. It's important to know because it means you went in to check to see if the kid's all right because we've got to get out of the house and he's not in bed. Good, he's not there, we'll find him. He's hiding under the bed or he's hiding in the closet. Half of them were hiding in the closet. Teenagers were worse. Teenagers didn't hear it. They didn't wake up. Which says, if you've got teenagers, it goes in their room, <laughs> right over their head. Okay? And if they smoke too much, too bad. <laughs> but uh, really important social information. Because we, we say, oh, we've got smoke detectors. We're all safe here. Are they out of date? Are they in the right place? Do we have enough of them? Are they really going to wake people up? They do save lives. They get you out in time. Because in many, many cases, you've got five minutes before you die, not of flames, you die of smoke. Toxication. You get knocked out, you're on the floor, you may still be alive, but then you get wiped out because you can't get out. Okay? So, but yeah, smoke detectors, but let's make sure they're working. CO detectors, particularly if you have any wood burning plants, doesn't go right next to the plants. Doesn't matter where a CO detector is because the CO moves all over the place. It could be low, it could be high, wherever it's convenient. Smoke detector goes on the top because it rises. Okay? Um, and there are lots of different kinds. This particular one that I show you here, actually, I like this. Labeling it says ideal for family room and kitchen because it's actually made with a little less sensitive for the toaster. And it actually, that one has a toast off button so that you actually have a button that if it went off with the toast, you just don't push the button. You don't have to get out there and start waving things at it to try to shut it off. The worst thing is that when you wave too much at it, what happens? Somebody pulls it out. Okay, fire extinguishers. The only thing I really want to, two things about fire extinguishers, real quick, is that there are A, B, and C fire extinguishers. It says so right on the box. And what it really boils down to is A is going to be your ordinary combustibles, wood, cloth, paper, rubber, many plastics. B is flammable liquids, oil, grease, things like that. And C is electrical stuff. A combined one for a house ABC is the best. It's not perfect for any of those applications, but it works for all of them, okay? If you're really in a place where it's nothing but motors, they have electrical ones. And if you're in a place where it's nothing but wood, then they have wood that ones for wood and paper that are more efficient. The real important thing, and you, these cost too much to practice, that's the real problem. The television, I get the fun thing that the fire department set it up, so because we had cameras, I got to practice, and they would set a fire and I could put it out. The thing is that you need to study how to do it first. This one is used upright. Many of them are used upside down. You want to study that before you have a fire. Because if you have to find your glasses and start reading this, you're in trouble. Okay? You're better off just to leave. And this goes next to the exit doorway. It does not go next to the stove, not next to the fireplace, because that's where the fire starts, and you can't get to it. And what you want to always know, if this is near the exit, I go to the exit, I think about picking up the fire extinguisher, and I look at the fire, and I say, do I have a chance or not? If I don't have a chance, I just get out and make sure everybody's out. If I get a chance, okay, we're going to see if we can deal with this and get it. Third thing is, this thing works for 30 seconds. It doesn't go on and on and on. It's not a fire in cells. So if you spend 30 seconds figuring out where it's going to spray, you ain't got anything. And the biggest mistake people make, and they've actually filmed this, they set people up in emergency situations and just let them do it with no instructions. To find out what they did. They all shot the flames. You have to shoot where the flames are burning, the base. That's what you have to put out. So you've got to go down to the base. And by the way, if it's grease on the stove, you don't use this. Because if you shoot this on grease on the stove, what do you do? You push the grease up to the wall in flames. Okay, it splatters. You're better off a blanket on it or something better. If you've really got a good mind and it's just something burning on the stove, put a lid on it. Okay? And it'll die lack of oxygen. Just close it off like that real quick. 
and the other way. But you be careful. But you've got to go with the flames, and this one's got to be up this way, and it's got to be really quick at the flames. As soon as you're up, if you haven't finished it, if you can't control what little bit is left, get up. You're better off to give up on the house than to fight with something like that. You got a lot of more heating? What's the advantage of doing this or this? This guy, oh, it's real easy because I can go outside, it doesn't go through the whole house and everything else. All this is freezing cold whenever that thing's not on, and it's sending back into the stove all that cold air. And that's why you have a hard time getting a fire started. You gotta use a lot of hot kindling and stuff to try to get it started. And you'll build up a lot more creosote soap in the chimney like this because it's constantly getting extremely cold and freezing, if you will, bringing down the creosote that's in the air quickly instead of letting it up. This guy stays warm right up to there, in fact, a little bit into the attic. And this is, an they're both insulated, but it, there's no heat loss at all here. Well, it's, it's heating the house, actually, you're gaining all of that, and a little bit out on the outside. So this one's going to work much better, and it's going to stay clean. And you've got to clean the chimneys. Have you ever been in a chimney fire? Not in a chimney fire, but in a house with a chimney fire, it is a primary experience. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about? Just this roar comes up, it's, it's like a blowtorch of mag, big magnitude. That's a chimney sweep. And you can get them different lengths, different shapes, you get them to match your chimney, and you clean it once or twice a year, depending on how much you use the stove, how good your wood is. The harder your wood, the more it's hardwood, the more it's dry, the less you need to clean. The more you're using soft wood or wet wood, the more often you need to clean. So you may clean a couple times a year if you don't have ideal wood to work with. And so that's why the chimney sweep uses. They're available at the hardware stores. You get extensions of that fiberglass rod. You work your way down, you go down, you got a vacuum cleaner downstairs sucking it out. Not your wife's vacuum cleaner, because it can never be used for anything else again. You know, take your shop vac or something, or go rent one. Tell them what you're using it for, though, so that they don't come back and say, oh, you did a chimney sweep with that? Okay. But you can clean this out, and you can clean the shelves. Uh, you don't really want to go while there's ice on the roof, but uh, if you take care of it, and make sure that the chimney's clear. But the design thing here is critically different. It makes a big, big difference. Did anybody figure out how the guy got his cell phone yesterday? Did it, did it, would it fit on the plane? Okay. <laughs> so, as I said before, preventative maintenance is fixing things before they totally stop working. Which allows you to work in the daytime, good weather, a hockey game, nobody giving you a real big trouble. How about questions on this? Oh, I'm going to go, I got a couple more glues here. Let's take the glues. Uh, contact cement. Uh, there are two kinds, water-based and solvent-based. Solvent-based costs more per can, but less per square inch because it goes further. So it's actually cheaper than the solvent-based, and stronger, and works to a higher temperature. So it's a far better glue than is the good old traditional solvent-based. But it doesn't sniff as well, okay? You know, I, I grew up sniffing glue as a little kid building model airplanes, so I, I, I did a lot of that. Um, my mother never knew she just kept buying me bottles of glue because I was so nice and quiet. And <laughs> but it kept me quiet. Uh, so that's one thing. Now you want to fix a little bit of uh, melamine or uh, formica on the countertop. You warm it up with this. You put a little bit more contact cement back there. You let it dry in the air and push it back in. If you're putting on trim on the side of plywood or press board and you're using contact cement or even the iron-on tape, it always falls off, right? What you do is before you get to the tape, you actually sand it so it's nice and smooth, no dust on there. You take your contact cement, your water-based contact cement, and you paint a coat on it. You'll notice it soaks all in because the end grain of that wood just soaks it in. It disappears. Let it disappear and leave it for several hours. I want it dry. It's not a, because we always do this kind of tacky. I don't want tacky. I want it to dry. It soaks in, locks to the fibers of the wood, and presents a, a light coating on the face which is a perfect primer to come back and put a coat here and a coat here, let them get tacky, put them together, and they will never come off again. They come off because we had tape on the first one, or we put glue on both sides, this glue disappeared, you went on to nothing. Okay? Or the tape went on and all the glue went into the wood and it disappeared. But when you prime it with the contact cement and let it totally dry, that surface now, you touch it, it feels like rubber when it's totally dry. It's ready to receive the other glue. And then you're not going to have a little trick popping off all the time. Uh, when we're talking about pl plumbing, here's a uh, sticks, epoxy sticks that you take. And they, you know, they have two colors in it, and you mix it all up. 
that's the two parts of the epoxy that get in there. So that can do really solid plumbing things like we were doing with the tape wrap a little bit earlier. And of course your standard epoxies come, this is probably the best way if you don't use it often because you can actually put a cap back on and they actually make the cap so you can't put it on backwards and glue everything together. Uh, so you put the cap back on and it feeds you two streams of the same quantity at the same time. And that's not always true. One of them tends to get plugged up more than the other and then you get this weird balance. So then you take a knife and you separate off the too much because you want equal quantities of, to work right. So you throw a little bit away but you get equal quantities and then you can use it. They come in five minutes, they come in 30 minutes, they come in a lot of two hours. So you're going to mix up according to what you're doing. Be careful because if you mix up too much of the five minutes too soon, it just goes. And the hotter it is, the quicker it goes. Now, if you need to stretch epoxy, you make sure it's cold. How do you do that? You can actually take a plastic container to mix epoxy, particularly if you're doing a, a fairly large thing, or fiberglass. If you're doing fiberglass resin, if you're too compact to mix, you might be doing boats, and you're putting fiberglass resin on there or patching your car with fiberglass patches. Mix it in a plastic bowl that's sitting in an ice bucket. And the ice will extend the work time. Without, because it's in plastic, it doesn't get wet, but it stays cool. And if you do it on a cool day, you'll find you'll actually have a long time to work with epoxy. As soon as it comes out of there and you start putting it on, it's harder. But while you're down there, you can buy time when you need to buy more time in terms of doing it. And then you can get the epoxy in larger quantities and tubes. Again, equal quantities always mix them up. Some of these things actually come with color games so you can tell when it's the, the color, you know, when it's mixed together. That's is one reason why there are always two colors to the mix. So when when it's all one color, you know it's it's properly mixed and ready to go. There are a couple of them turn pink and some other things that help out a little bit. Anything else I got here that we didn't talk about? Oh, back around. I gotta show you a quick video here. Um, this is a fun little thing. If I can get the, my computer to decide to wake up and here we go. In that show, and we'll get out of there. I'll we'll drop over to the uh, website, and on the website I've got a little video I'm going to show you here. This is a video we made with LePage about how to cock, and uh, I'll sort of walk through it because you won't be able to hear the sound. But um, what it basically says when you're cocking, what you want to do is learn a few things on the techniques. Uh, first of all, there's all kinds of cocking, so you find out what you want. But the most important detail is how you cut the head. And some of them will tell you to cut it at an angle, but that doesn't really like help much. A lot of guys actually like to split it at the angle like that. I prefer it just square. The reason I like it square is that I don't want to come at an angle and lay it down. You see how it just peels off? Because you just laid it there, and particularly if you didn't clean the surface. If you actually clean the surface well, point the caulking gun straight in or move upwards as you go, you're shoving the caulking ahead of yourself, shoving it into the crack. Now I'm going to actually level it with a little piece of plastic that has cut corners that are square. This is not a spoon, it's not a wet finger, it doesn't make a concave. We're actually making a triangle there. And you will need that, see if you do this, you take a look at the end of the pocket and you'll see there's hardly any meat left on the end here. And when something shrinks, it just cracks down the middle. If we leave more meat, it's not going to crack as lightly down the middle. Or it might pull away from one side, you've seen that often. Now, we want to do something that's deep. We put backer rod in and then we pop. Now, why that? We don't want it to all disappear. Now, here's a concrete wall. If I just put caulking into that slot, it's not going to hold. Why? It cracks right there. If I put masking tape first, so the glue will not stick to the concrete on the bottom, and the glue only sticks to the two sides, I now have a rubber band in the middle, and it can stretch. Okay? So you put a release layer in the bottom of something like that. All the sticking is on the side. It's not on the rest. If you're doing grout and tiles, grout does not stick to grout. You take off a little bit of old grout and grout on top, it pops up. Grout sticks to the side of the tiles. You have to go down as deep as it is wide. You clean out as deep as it is wide, and you squirt your stuff in, and understand it's only sticking to the sides, so the sides are clean. A lot of them don't care about it. I just made it as deep as it is wide. It's deeper that's why. As deep as it is wide, I'm sticking to the side of the tiles. That's what sticks. Grout does not stick to grout. Silicone does not stick to silicone. You re caulk over the caulking. It doesn't really stick that well if it's a silicone. Other caulkings, if they're clean, stuck like crazy to the two sides of the cracked. I can clean it all up, but I'll usually take a beer can opener and slide down the crack to make it bigger so I can squeeze something in the crack. Okay? That's just a quick, easy way. Those little beer can openers, you know? The, 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 made the 
triangular shaped hole, they're great. Save them all. Don't ever let anybody throw them away. Just go down the cracking cock, uh, the, the, the crack in the cocking, and it opens up just enough that I can bite my new cocking in. And I don't have to remove I'll remove anything that must come off. I'll bang it, I'll scrape it, and everything else. But the stuff that you got to fight with, I'll clean. Because it's well stuck. And I'll take some solvent and a brush and I'll clean it, and my new cocking will stick to it. But if I just lay it on the top, that movement will just crack. I gotta get some medium. And I don't want this beautiful curve. And the lady may want it. Don't let her talk you into it. Make it a triangle shape so it's got some meat. Okay? Um, what else we got lying around? Anything that I haven't talked about? All this great stuff? Do you have a way that we're gonna get away those tools? Do you have any questions? This or something else that you want to ask? <laughs> yes? One question. The copper uh, piping, copper piping. I'll compare what are your thoughts on uh, PEX pipes and copper Copper and PEX? There, um, there are a lot of people who are complaining that PEX is really not good. And that, that breaks. And a lot of people say it's just fine. Usually it's the joints. So our biggest problem usually in this piping is the joints. For a long time, municipalities, we'd find that uh, they kind of accepted plastic piping for cottages because it's not too important. And they always wanted copper because they, they knew copper. They knew it. it was reliable. Uh, so there's still a debate, and uh, when you get, we have PEXL PEX, which had aluminum in the middle, and PEX on the inside and outside, and then you, you have polybutyl. There's a lot of discussion about polybutyl failing. Uh, the failures originally were all in southern the United States, in the ceilings of mobile homes in the desert. They cooked the stuff. Plus, they have about three times the level of chlorine we did. And so that got through. Now we've got more and more reports coming of older polybutylene that is having some problems in Ontario. So the questions kind of go, officially it's perfect. Uh, there's more question about polybutylene, but some of the plastic piping seems to be doing just fine. Uh, I've got a lot from my own house. Um, so it, it, it's kind of rough debate because I mean, it's officially approved. It's officially all right. Some local inspectors don't like it, and so they are God. They do what they want, <laughs> and you follow. Uh, but uh, we do know copper is reliable, but if you can get the junk side right. <laughs> okay. But uh, plastic piping is a, is a difficult situation because we get these great reports, and then later on we find some other things. Often we find this relates to workmanship or to the joints that are used or the way it was put together. Um, there are some crimping systems that are really good. Most of them are commercial, big crimpers, and they seem to have no problems because they're putting tremendous pressure for closing off the ends of the pipes and attaching everything. Um, there are some other systems that are really great. If you actually uh, have a gun that you put into the pipe and it expands it temporarily, you put your fitting in and it comes down, put a little ring on the top. Uh, they seem to have no problems. Uh, Milwaukee just brought out a, a battery-operated gadget for expanding the pipe. So you just go in, it goes click, 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 and the pipe is expanded, pop it in, and away. Uh, so there's lots of good stuff. The hard thing for contractors is you're in God's life down the line. And that's why there's so little change or often not take up on those things. That you're, a lot of guys are waiting 15, 20 years to see if it's still working, and then I'll put it in my house. Um, so you know, I'd love to just say, yeah, it's no problem. I don't see it as a big problem, but we do have cases of a big problem. We don't always know exactly why. Problem. Now, some of the problems we do have, too. Like some did, you put all this plastic pipe in the ceiling, and he forgot that it was too close, and when he started to hang himself, he was sitting there right through his main pipe, water line, you know. Those are kind of sad stories of just a screw up there, and you start tearing everything down. Um, so, and to give you an honor, I, I can't just say absolutely yes, plastic pipe is infallible. Uh, we don't seem to have the documentation to be able to say that, like a salesman would. So, I hope that just for plumbing blue, they put anything wrong with that. The plumbing blue? Yeah. The, uh, the, the just for copper? Yes. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of inspectors who don't know it, therefore they don't trust it. Uh, what I, in my research on it, I finally found out there is no code requirement for solder. And they meet the same standards and better than what solder meets. But neither one of them are code required. Because they just never put it in one code as to what it is that you've got to use for solder. And uh, so all they say is, we've done the same tests, we perform better than solder does. But, so they have that documentation. 
mean health and safety wise or just health and safety is no problem. Health and safety, there's there's no toxicity. That's what I mean. Drinking water is no problem. It has the NSF so you certification. Can't say, like, pets, you can't say that, but that's stuff you can say absolutely no problem. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's, it's got NSF certification. Okay. We check it out, it's got the certification from now what is it, N safety something like that. Yes? You, you talked about the uh, cleaning the chimney. Cleaning the chimney, yeah. Yeah, uh, I have an oil furnace at home. Um, do you use the same maintenance on it? You do need to do the same maintenance on an oil furnace. Uh, at, at least once a year, give it a good clean out. Now, an oil furnace, the nice thing is it usually has a clean out down the bottom, so everything goes down to that clean out and it's less messy for the rest of it. Uh, but yes, you should be running through and doing that. And the thing with the oil furnace, a uh, little tiny gadget there is to uh, be careful. We happen to be, as long as the uh, Wi-Fi is working here, we're on my website, and you go to the search of the website, and there's uh, about uh, 3,000 pages in here. So if I want to go to furnace and look up in the search, there's several ways to search, but this one's my favorite. And then I want to come down here to oil, and let's see if we've got oil furnaces in here. Now I know it. So if we just go into furnaces, you'll actually, there's 50 different results here in the oil furnace. But you come in here, and there'll be one that actually shows a thing called a barometric damper which is that little air damper that you have that controls the air that flows into the flue on the way. I want you to go once a year and oil the pins. Don't adjust it. You don't know how to adjust it. Just tap it, see if it swings free. If it doesn't swing, swing free, clean it with a pipe cleaner or something, a little oil to the end. If it's swinging free, it'll save you a lot of oil. If it's stuck, it doesn't work right. Okay? Oh, furnace filters, by the way. Furnace filters, when they're dirty, they work better. They filter more air. But there's less air goes through the furnace. So it takes more fuel going up the chimney to get the same heat into the house. And you can double the cost of your furnace use by dirty filters. They clean the air better, but they'll double your heating costs. And so the best of the filters would be big four inch filters that are pleated because they actually look pretty well. In fact, the best is electronic air filter, but they're selling less and less because you've got to clean them all the time. Nobody wants to clean them. Uh, but they actually do the best filtration job when they're clean, and then the worst filtration when they're not clean because everything just goes straight through. Uh, that cheap $1.95 furnace filter to get a Canadian tire uh, is only designed for cat hairs or, or bear hairs or whatever you've got floating around your house. Um, but that's, it's only there really to protect the motor. It has nothing to do with your health in the house. So if you want to get a decent one, go to 3 ohm Filtrix. There's a number of them from good, better to best. And the best of them does a fantastically good job of static electricity. You can buy $150 little filters that are electric and plug in. Don't waste your money. Okay? You'll be just as well off with that filter as one that will last you three, four months, and it costs you 20 bucks. And it's a throw. Okay? Other questions? Yeah. One, yeah. one thing. Uh, oil filters from the tank to the furnace, there's a little filter there. The oil filter from the tank to the furnace. Um, now, theoretically, the tank doesn't have that dirty oil. You don't need to do it very often, but I think that it should be checked at least every season and uh, make sure that, because what it'll do, it, it doesn't change the cost of your heating. It just blocks up the heat. You can't get any oil into the furnace at some point. And what it's doing is protecting the whole furnace mechanism by keeping sediment out. Oh, by the way, if you want to find problems in your oil tank, run your hand all over the bottom. Any spot that's cold is a rust spot in the process of happening. Tanks do not rust from the outside in. They rust from the inside out. And they actually start because of mineral deposits that go into that filter. Mineral deposits that sit on the inside of the tank cause a little electrolytic reaction. They eat away the resistance material, the coating that's in there. And then they attack that. And they'll finally leak out of the tank. It will blister from the inside out. But it can be spotted ahead of time by a, a cold spot. And if you have these infrared cameras, it's great. But if you don't, your hand can actually feel the difference. And when you have one spot that feels cold, you know that tank's on the way to die. And it's one way to find before it's gone that uh, there's really a problem about to happen. Now, they also sell a lot of container pads now. Most tanks come in, they just like a plastic or a metal tray. It means if you've got a spill, you're going to have a fair amount of spill before it actually goes into the ground or into the concrete or something. So you've got time to see it and clean it up. Now, if it fills all the way up, you're in real trouble. <laughs> But if you, you can get that little dripping and start seeing some dripping, you know you've got to deal with that before it gets worse. Because the environmental requirements now are becoming so horrendous. Quebec is worse than you guys. You guys have a little bit of intelligence in your policies on that. 
In Quebec, when we get a liter of oil spilled in a basement, we dig up the basement, we dig up the backyard, we dig up the neighbor's backyard, and we keep going until we have a zero oil contamination identification. So fences disappear and everything else is insane. Uh, they're basically trying to eliminate the oil industry, but uh, containers are a good thing for that. You guys at least have a more reasonable policy on that. You dig up the problem and then stop there. Insulating what? Insulating what? I, I don't know what you're insulating. Expanding foam, sorry. Oh, the expanding foam on it. And I've got it right here. We didn't use it. Uh, this is the great stuff, expanding foam. Uh, this one is maximum expansion. You can buy minimum expansion. The one of the story I was telling Chris earlier, a fellow, apparently true, uh, back in the days when this first came out, I was doing a little cottage in Regina and uh, by himself, and he had his cottage there. And one day he himself put all his windows in and his doors in. The house was empty on the inside, it was under construction, and he got his whole case of foam, and he went and foamed everything. Of course, nobody ever told him how to foam, so he did one shot of foam, filled the whole thing, and of course, it just kept growing and coming out. And he saw, I said, oh, I wasted a lot of foam as it was spilling onto the floor and everything else. But he sat down, he had his pizza there, he sat down, he had done every window and every door, and he sat down, ate his pizza, and watched the stuff grow, and he kind of waited until it was, he said, well, wait until it gets hard enough, I can cut it off. And so then he started to work on it a little bit, and he decided to go out to his car and found the door was jammed. And then he found that every window and every door in the house was jammed. They would not open. It was sliding windows, and they compressed down so hard. The glass wouldn't open. The door wouldn't open. We didn't have cell phones in those days, so he had to keep knocking on the window when passerbys would walk by until they finally got the fire department to cut his door out so that he could get out of this house. Um, it does expand, it can break windows and everything else. So the big expanding stuff you don't use on windows and doors. You go in and you do a little layer of special low expansion foam. You let it secure, you do another little layer, two or three layers coming out. Now there's even some more problems with it. The very first thing you want to do with any foam is you test it a little bit. Because if it's your first time, I guarantee you, you'll waste more than half the can. And it's expensive. Okay? Second time, you'll be a little bit more reasonable. But you've got to be careful a little bit when you want to do this. It shakes up a lot, then we get it to come out. And you can actually do a lot of different foam levels, because you can control this stuff. And you need to learn how to control it so I can do a little tiny bit, how can I do a lot, and you play with that. And I just sort of squirted that, I'm holding it here and let it sit. And you also see that this now is going to drip all over the place and never come off of anything it drips on. Um, and if you throw it in a garbage can, the next day your garbage can is one piece it comes all out. It's, it's like a piece of art work. A new thing that most people don't know about expanding foam, all this polyurethane foam, it actually uh, cures by moisture coming into it. It takes moisture from the air to cure. It's not a drying process. It's the, it needs moisture to cure. And for years, we would build our houses with Tyvek, and we would wrap the Tyvek into the window, and then we'd put the window in, and then we'd foam. And in fact, we'd take the backer rod, because you didn't want the foam coming out the other side of that slot. So you get this backer rod that comes in all kinds of thicknesses. You put it in the back like you saw in my caulking video, and then the foam comes up to the backing rod. Nowadays, we've changed the technique a little bit, and there's some problems. We started to put elastomeric wrap around windows, the kind of stuff we put on the roof. Okay? And we have vinyl windows, and we have closed cell foam. And by the time we put elastomeric rubber wrap here, Vinyl window here and foam here, there is no source of moisture for the foam. And if it happens to be a dry day and you happen to put it in fairly thickly, what happens is the, the sheet, the little thin part on the outside that is exposed to the air gets hard and you think it's all in good shape. And then you go on to another layer, another layer. But you have now boxed in that first set of foam with absolutely no access to moisture. So slowly the bubbles that are in the foam will now flow to the top, and the foam will flow to the bottom, and you'll end up with a concentrated acidic liquid in the bottom. It will take about a week to eat its way through the foam or the caulking here, come out onto the siding, drip down the wall, destroy any paint in its path, and you're replacing an entire vinyl sided wall, or a, not vinyl, you can not vinyl usually, but aluminum that takes the paint right off, and it drips out there. You clean this one up, three weeks later the next one drips because it finally broke free because it has a reservoir of acid sitting there. When it comes out, it contacts with the air and it foams up. 
Okay? And it gets hard. And so you break it off and say, okay, I got it stopped. Go out the next morning, it's coming again. And it's coming. So that is why, and you may have heard the rumors, but that finally explains why, if you have a rubber wrap on the window, vinyl window, and backer rub, which is a good idea, you spritz it with water. We don't want any dripping water. We want some humidity back there. You spritz the whole thing with a water spray, just a push push can. And, but not dripping water, because then nothing will stick. But we just get a little bit of moisture, and we do that for a shot. And after that started to set up, and you think it's quick moving, then we go to the next one, and we shoot it with a little, little bit of spray. But we got to get, if we were up against wood, if we were up against Tyvek, it works, because moisture shouldn't go through Tyvek. But if you're up against rubber and vinyl, you've got to spritz it. Okay, and that's, that's very little known in the industry. We just, when we started running into it, I went back to the manufacturers, and they said, oh, yes, we have a paper on that. <laughs> we don't tell anybody, but we have a paper on that. Um, and so, yes, it's known to the industry, and it's something we have to do to get out to everybody. That that's a critical thing to get polyurethane foam, one component foam to work properly. Two component foam has its own reactors. One kind of component. So the pros that have the big hoses has two component foam. They don't have that problem. But when you're coming in with a one component can, whether it's professional or, or do it yourself, it's got to be spritzed. <coughs> that was a good note to end on. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that one. That was good.